Welcome fingers, fixers, and feathers back to How It Feels, the only series on YouTube that's actually trying to dissect the PM characters one at a time. I swear I haven't forgotten about this, I have simply placed it in a warp train and you all happen to be inside. Today we're talking about the broken bug man himself, Gregor. Because so often we ask about what characters are doing in a game, but not how they're doing in a game. And in a word, <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the facts. Gregor is one of the main characters in the game Limbus Company, working as one of the sinners for a company the game is named after, who is tasked alongside his teammates to dive into the depths of the ruins of the old company Lobotomy Corporation and retrieve the Golden Bow, which are the essence of energy production technology for said corporation. Now with the onboarding out of the way, you can see we're working with a short king standing at 167 centimeters, or about 5 foot 6 in western units, sporting only 6 fingers, one of which is quite the pointer. Yeah. His right arm is a roach's claw. In fact, the only parts of his character that aren't in some way related to this claw are that he's one of the only members of the center crew to have some moniker of social skills, and that he's generally friendly without being annoying about it. It still sets him apart more than I really expected, but since you can generally lump the sinners into one of three groups, having him just be the normal guy with trauma wasn't gonna be enough, because we already have Sinclair for that, and this isn't his video. No, Project Moon went full war story on this chitin-covered Chad, and we're going to start right from the beginning of Kanto 1. Needless to say, spoilers ahead. While much of the focus in this chapter is reserved for giving our main character Dante a chance to understand his lot in life, Gregor starts to stand out early on as being more friendly and comforting to the manager out of any of the other sinners on the bus, which is always appreciated after being threatened by one of the most powerful people in the city. Dante. And that trend continues upon introducing the team's guide for this adventure, Yuri, a former agent of L Corp. Since Limbus Company only exists because Lobotomy Corporation went under in a mysterious incident, it only makes sense to hire a guide to help the sinners know what threats to expect for their first mission. And Yuri is just the person for the task. She's polite, she's outspoken, and she's also desperate for work after being suddenly laid off. So as a Project Moon fan, I have only confidence that things are looking up for her from here. Surely because he sees her the same way, Gregor gives her a polite greeting and tries to make small talk once she's on the bus, despite not being great at it, but Prescript bless him for trying. And speaking of which, Gregor gets a chance to meet some of his own friends. Or at least, that's what Virgilius implies. As we near the ruins of an Elcorp branch, the sinners are met with some people with augmentations that look surprisingly like Gregor's, minus the fact that they also affect the head. And while they end up being as hostile as any other speed bump up to this point, the two we talk to do mention seeing Gregor somewhere before. Uh, but hey, maybe he's just got one of those faces, y'all feel? Eh, after some quick cleanup and lunch served to the bus, so... Did I mention the bus effectively runs on people? So the pattern of running over randos continues until properly getting to the Elcorp Ranch ruins, where Verge introduces the two fixer guys that work with Yuri. These two aren't terribly important, so I'll just call them I'm a Kebab and Hemorrhoid Kissass as they travel through the ruins of Elcorp. Oh, and what do you know? One of the first sites everyone's greeted with are more Roach Heads, who I'm just gonna call G Corvettes from here on out, because, you know, that's exactly what they all are. The Sinners Dozen and Co. initially are freaked out seeing them grouped over some corpse, until they try to make a bargain. Just let them take what they want from this floor, and the vets won't stop them from getting anything they want on the floors below. It's a solid, if not suspicious, deal, until one of them lays eyes on Gregor, at which point these vets decide to come out of retirement and rage at the mere sight of him, calling him a traitor and deserter to their side and saying the interesting phrase, I can't believe I ever saluted you. We get the clear sense that Gregor's arm was more than just some fad prosthetic he'd later come to regret, but a tool of war and propaganda. Gregor claps back, saying that all of them ended up being discarded after the war, including himself. Since everyone but Gregor's augmentations affected their face, that argument doesn't let him save his own. Because you see, these aren't just veterans. These are veterans from the losing side of their war. The Smoke War, to be specific, which is a topic for another video, but as a result, the old G Corp dissolved. And if making a living was hard enough after coming from a fallen wing, imagine not only that, but having your face always being marked with that wing's failure, on top of being shell-shocked. We'll talk more about this later, but Gregor is insanely lucky to be in the position he is now. Warts, exoskeleton, and all. And he sure as hell knows it. But since they started the fight, the vets soon don't have either a leg to stand on, nor the rest of the body for that matter, and the raiding party continues on. 
And as it turns out, Yuri unfortunately doesn't know every inch of the building and the monsters within, at which point Hemorrhoid's last name becomes Hardass, and Ima apologizes for the emotional gut punch she just gave, before receiving a very literal one herself and dying to the dungeon's first boss. And after egging the plant with attachment issues, these 16 adventurers are now down to 15, and go stargazing just in time for a likely war criminal to judge their life choices on the next floor. And while it would be rude for you to expect that Gregor knows everyone with a bug face, a lot of them know him. And also, this happens to be the one that Gregor kinda recognizes anyway. He's his former head manager, and as you would expect, this is not a happy reunion. There's the usual complaints about Gregor killing his comrades and deserting, but Mr. Yowie Hands here makes a very telling statement that to him, the war and struggle never ended. And even after the inevitable fight, Gregor gives him a sharp middle finger, telling the guy he had to sell off his very own Medal of Honor to pay rent, showing that no matter what ranks they had before, everyone from the old G Corp may as well be considered pests now. Gee, it's almost like war propaganda literally means nothing after the war and only serves to function as a lot of hot gas for those involved. Ah, shit. And as a fun cue, that's when the fumigation starts. But before you guys get choked up, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. If you want to skip ahead, here's the timestamp. But even if you're only here for the Limbus Company chatter, there's still something for you in this ad. Because this video is sponsored by my own YouTube editing business. Most people who run a channel know that finding an editor is a lot of work. Not only do you have to subject yourself to bad applications and bots, but even after you find someone who might work, you're basically getting the worst parts of a Tinder date and interview texting someone. And afterward, you'll probably have to worry about whether or not they'll message you back, let alone get your video to you on time. And to that I say, be not afraid. Because our, my, commissions make this a lot easier. Before doing any kind of work, we can sit down in a Discord call together, figure out the kinds of videos you're making, make a plan for your channel's content, and how to do that in whatever budget you have so that it works for both of us. I've been doing this with a handful of different creators now, and my clients have told me it makes a huge difference knowing that we're on the same page, and that it's easy to get in touch. Just head over to at Chikama on Twitter, link in the description, and send over a DM. If you see the white dot in my name, then I'm open to taking clients. And those who have been around for a while may notice that I tend to focus a lot more on quality than quantity with this channel, and there's been a project in the works for a long, long time. So if anyone would like to support the channel beyond pushing the big red button, please share this video out to anyone you think needs an editor, because this ad is the only reason I can justify even making this one, and I really don't want to shoehorn capitalism into this pure animation. But I think y'all get the point now, let's get back to the suffering. The Sinners and Co. move on to find a staggering amount of corpses in the hallways, and I mean, like, meat lair level shit, and soon realize that L Corp was both a figurative and literal toxic work environment. Because despite these not being included in the original game, L Corp apparently had abnormalities suppressing gas grenades, and one just happened to go off. The Sinners are starting to bleed from their ears, and probably everywhere else, and wonder what's going on until Mr. Hemorrhoid shows up with a gas mask and starts gloating about how their office was prepared for this, neglecting to include Yuri in that statement. He then takes his encephalin, says, got mine, sucks to suck, and runs off, leaving the rest to die. But during these trying times, Gregor sees how really only one person is in danger, and takes a spare mask that he stashed off of Aya to give to Yuri, knowing the rest of them can be brought back by Dante's clock. She takes it, but despite wearing the mask, seeing her comrades die in real time around her gives Yuri some flashbacks that make her sick, and she starts agreeing with everything Hopkins said about her. She explains that the day L Corp shut down, she only managed to escape the facility minutes before it literally went underground and trapped all of her co-workers with the abnormalities for good. Remembering that she intentionally left people behind to this fate for her own sake, she can't help but ask if she even deserves to still be alive, let alone employed. And as one of the few left alive, Gregor doesn't pull any punches. Paraphrasing, he tells her that yes, that is a sin, but only to anyone that you left behind to get here. But who cares? You've got to live on like it's nobody's business instead of letting that guilt tear your life apart. Because if you do, then you may as well have just stayed trapped. And after these very well put last words, Gregor then dies, giving Yuri some time to chew on that while she and Dante carry the bodies back to bring the Suicide Squad back to life. They then meet a blockhead, fix an egg timer, and head to the final floor of the facility. And it's here where things start to get intense. Because this time, the war flashbacks are on co-op mode! 
Almost immediately, Gregor gets drawn to a door that brings everyone into one of the battles of the Smoke War. And before anyone can get their bearings as to what's going on, a bright-eyed private named Toma offers to bring the rising star of G-Corp to the front lines. Gregor refuses, and the rest of the crew starts blasting. And while you'd think he'd be right along with them, Gregor pulls an Inception, giving us a flashback within a flashback with a vague memory of his time in G-Corp. In this memory, he's held in a room with a swinging apple and told that he can leave as soon as he uses his fancy appendage to cut it down. A few days pass, and people just think he's dumb, explaining exactly what he has to do to get out, and eventually he does. But only after enough time passed for him to learn helplessness and accept his current lot in life, thinking that it'll help him escape from the nightmare he's currently in. And this starts to put the pieces together that Gregor was not only forced into this position from the start, but has been there since the ripe age of 15. As he passively angsts his way out of the research facility frying pan, though, it wouldn't be long until he's thrown into the fires of war doing the exact same thing to real people. And fittingly enough, that realization puts the crew right back into the original vision. Only this time, things get a bit more real. Bean Boy Toma is back and shares that Gregor's operation was conducted by someone named Herman. But don't worry if you missed that part. Because immediately after, both Toma and his genetics become even more pushy. Ha! Oh, Christ! Ha! Ah, what is that? Ah, fuck! And by now, the centers have realized that this flashback isn't entirely based off of Gregor's memories, but by his feelings. His feelings of being pushed to lead in a war he didn't want to be a part of, to make an agreement to change his body, and to work at a company where virtually every employee was, let's say, obligated to take this procedure. Yuri, being just as done with this nonsense, asks if anyone even agreed to it. But it turns out that dubious contracts are a specialty of the wings, as everyone at both G Corp and L Corp agreed to it, without knowing just how extreme that either the procedures, nor working with the abnormalities would be. Classic city manipulation in a nutshell. Gregor then has another flashback to himself on a train, not that one, and resets the simulation. Roja accessorizes Yuri with a death flag of a job offer, and everyone's ready for Toma to arrive any second. And that he does, but not how you'd think. He's not trying to warn anyone anymore. Instead, all he can say is, I need help. I don't want to die. Before going from Private Ryan to Pulverized Roach. This grotesque sight is followed up by the entire landscape being pummeled as if some unknowable entity intended to squash this memory like a bug. But judging by how detailed the fingernails on this hand are, this is probably someone that Gregor knows. The sinners start to run away from the avalanche of fingers until Gregor realizes that the only way to leave his own nightmare is to do the thing he's always done, except that you can't escape at all and stop resisting. Following that train of thought, the crew give in to the original one who grips and are sent back into the halls of the facility. Having escaped the vision, they're now led to the final abnormality to face before getting the golden bow. And it's, well, it's kind of adorable, isn't it? Oh god! Yuri then proceeds to die off screen, and Gregor takes up her death flag and decides to just wash it in apple blood, cause why not at this point? And once that job's done, the sinners are greeted with just exactly what everyone needed to see at this moment. Everyone may see the con behind this cosplay, but it doesn't make it any easier to deal with. Gregor takes point and starts extending his arm to cut her down, but both the apple's impression of Yuri and the grief suddenly get to him. Dante tries to snap him out of it by telling Gregor to finish the job, but by using an unfortunate choice of words, he ends up shutting Gregor further into one last memory. Back on the train, nope, still not that one, Gregor was peacefully laughing at how much they messed up his face on his old posters, and seems to have adjusted to some degree now that the war was over. But as we all know, nothing is ever that simple in the city. So as some strangers smack talk his spurs, he starts to get nauseous and ends up losing control of his arm, nearly killing a civilian who was just asking if he was okay. Thinking he's robbing her, both the woman and a security guard plead and threaten him to stop. But already doing all he can to hold his arm back, all Gregor can do now is beg the guard to cut his arm off. And even after he does, it's only a few seconds until it regenerates and goes for the guard next. Cut back to today, and Gregor is still lost enough that he's pleading with this false form of Yuri to keep going, forgetting anything other than what he's had to tell himself in that very moment before her head is finally silenced and cut to the ground. However, Gregor wasn't the one who did the job, and as the golden bow begins to sprout out of her mouth, a second group appears from the side to claim it, the one leading them, calling herself Herman. 
the same person who set the events of Gregor's life into motion by giving him the procedure to replace his arm. But before anyone can stop her or take the golden bow themselves, another one of her allies causes them to all fall asleep, meaning that the entire mission was a failure. The crew then arrive back on the bus to get chewed at by Virgilius, and are left to sulk in their own defeat. Gregor then gets up one more time and hangs Yuri's mask on the bus's windshield as a memento, the last shot we see in the credits being everyone managing in their own way while on the bus, including Dante crying in his hands, and Gregor thoughtfully looking out the window in what I can only assume is him contemplating how to move forward from this experience. So, how exactly does it feel to be Gregor? Well, it's not great, but by city standards, it's not terrible. And that's kind of the point. Gregor is a perfect example of someone who's still figuring out how to balance their sense of standing up for himself and accepting what's out of his control. He was left to be experimented on as a teen, possibly even younger, and made into a killing machine meant to lead an army in a corporate war which he didn't even want to be a part of, let alone the effective mascot for. Anyone who's worked in a customer service job knows the feeling of having to talk out of your ass to justify whatever nonsense your higher up are up to, but when you are forced to become one of those higher ups that others look up to, and take an active role in said nonsense, it gets very easy to be very annoyed with everyone around you very quickly. Couple that with the facts that this was during a fucking war, he and his comrades became literal pests, and he ended up being the mascot of a lost war and wing, means that Gregor's life is already full of more than his fair share of regrets. And remember, this is before we even get into the aftermath. This canto is called the outcast for a reason, because anyone made into an unwilling figurehead would of course choose to dip out after the conflict was over and his entire company went under, but the other G-Corp employees weren't so lucky. Since Gregor's own procedure was one of the few that left his face intact, and led to him being lauded with praise, he had the means to walk away from all of it. But like the head manager said, nothing has ended. All of the stigma, conflict, and ways that the vets perceive themselves and are perceived by others are still the same as it was during the smoke war. Only unlike Gregor, they can't just find a job nearly as easily. And if Yuri was already hanging by a thread at some low-level office, you can imagine that this sense of wartime camaraderie is all that the vets had anymore. So it makes total sense that they would act as if nothing had changed, whether or not they made some kind of shared delusion or scapegoat in the process. And when you put all of that together, Gregor's lot isn't nearly as bad, which again, is the point. The man has major survivor's guilt, which he thankfully seems to have processed through in a healthy way, with some relapses, but he still has to remind himself daily that he deserves to live in any way he can in spite of what terrible things he was forced to do. But I do think there are two images of Gregor that sum him up perfectly. The first is his expression on the train, where he almost looks peaceful. His thoughts are still troubled by the constant reminders of the past, but he's starting to take a cynical humor in accepting it and is able to be generally well-adjusted and comfort those around him. And out of all the CGs in this chapter, I feel like this is the best one to show his development as a person, which is why this image feels like the perfect complement. Because in only a few moments, any semblance of that peace during this commute is gone becoming a horror for everyone involved. Taken off balance by some harsh reminders and someone being in the wrong place at the wrong time, Gregor is now in a position desperately fighting for control of both his life and the lives of those around him from himself. His arm, the symbol of all the ugliness and helplessness he has endured, now becoming something he has to actively fight against. And unfortunately, the most he's able to do is stall it, asking for someone else to remove it for him and even then, only redirecting its attack to someone else. And then there's this expression. This fucking expression, when I first saw it, killed me a little. This is exactly what it's like for Gregor, screaming in defiance of your own body and past, while having to use acceptance to find some imperfect way forward and knowing that you may have to flip between one of these two responses on a dime. The characters in Limbus Company are not like the ones in Lobotomy Corporation or Library of Ruina. They don't get to have clear answers to their problems, at least not at this stage. And at the end of Chapter 1, Gregor is this 
person who's simply trying by accepting what he can't control, remembering the friend that he made, forgetting those who he left behind, and finding out just what's next. Both that peace and desperation are a byproduct of choosing this life. And while I hope he's able to find a better answer in a later chapter, this uneasy peace is exactly how it feels to be Gregor. Fingers, fixers, and feathers, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this read into Gregor's character. As I mentioned, I'm able to justify making these videos as ads for my editing company, and I'm hoping that with enough clients, I can start to move my focus back over to this channel for these videos, as well as lobotomized. As of this moment, it seems like just another two or three channels to work with consistently will push me over the line into making enough to do just that. So if you want to see more stuff like this, sharing this video around to anyone you can will help immensely. For now, though, take care, goons and keep at it.